Good morning, everybody. So um, I'm going to uh, just go through where we stand in relation to customs. I think we've seen that one of the um, top three issues that are facing companies at the moment in relation to Brexit is um, the customs readiness and customs preparation. So it's quite heartening to see actually the results from the Brexit barometer that show um, a huge increase in companies who are more prepared, say, from when we started um, two years ago. And in particular, a lot more companies, um, I think up to 85% now, understanding how to classify their goods. So um, that's really good. And um, anyone who hasn't been on the, the customs training program to date, I definitely would encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, so I'm not going to go through uh, this. I think we've gone through this 100 times uh, this morning. As we know, we're, st we're looking now at 31st of October 2019 as the um, date for Brexit, unless we have some, uh, some withdrawal agreement in the meantime. So critically, um, that involves treating the... E and I know I'm, I'm going to re-emphasise this point, which has been emphasised a number of times this morning. Critically, that does involve treating the UK as a non-EU country. So importing from the UK and exporting to the UK is going to be the same as importing from outside the EU um, or exporting outside the EU. And the reason I say that, again, is um, people sometimes still get confused. And I was at a conference there about a month ago where I was giving an explanation of what would happen post-Brexit and, and the import declarations that are required, the export declarations, the details for going to ports. And at one point, um, one of the attendees turned around and said, is she actually saying that there's going to be customs controls on, on exports to the UK going forward? Which was kind of yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite hard sometimes to wrap your head around it that we would be actually selling into the UK and buying from the UK our closest trading um, partner as if um, they were a non-EU country, or in fact as a non-EU country, and in, in no different than purchasing from, for example, the States, notwithstanding that they are so close. So the work we've been doing is really to try and make sure that companies are prepared for that and really can kind of come to an understanding of how that will look post-Brexit. Once, and I think this is an important thing to remember, once the um, UK become a non-EU country, there's a certain sometimes a question as to, well, what can we do if we don't know what that's going to look like? And unfortunately, once the um, UK does become a non-EU country, there are specific things that happen. We don't have a choice in. The um, EU rules are quite clearly set down. The European Customs Code very specifically says what needs to happen once you're trading with a non-EU country. The WTO rules are quite specific. So, in fact, we do know what's going to happen on a customs side. The only thing that we really don't know is what the duty rates are going to be. And even in that case, we kind of really do know that at this point. Because we've been talking up to date as saying, okay, we know what the customs compliance rules are going to be. They can't change. We know what the regulations are going to be. They can't change. We don't know if there's going to be a free trade agreement, and that's going to impact the customs duty rates. Well, that's certainly true. We don't know that. But what we do know is that there currently um, isn't a trade agreement. There will, will not or be very unlikely to have one in place by 31st of October. So therefore, we know what the EU rates are going to be for importing into Ireland. And we know what the UK rates are going to be for importing into the UK, since they have published at least a 12-month schedule. So we know on a temporary basis, and assuming that they do get passed by Parliament, we know on a temporary basis what the UK rates are going to be. So in fact, when you're looking at customs preparations, there's very little that people don't know. And I think it's very important, um, as one of our speakers said this morning, um, you need to prepare, and unfortunately, you do need to prepare for a worst-case scenario because that's what we're facing in a situation where there's a hard Brexit. The only, then, if that doesn't happen, at least um, the, the worst that can happen is that you're over-prepared. So if you're running a business and running a, um, an SME business, as I used to myself, you can never really be over-prepared. So we usually split out, um, and I've certainly seen this over the last six months, over the last two years, we would have been very much planning on the short, medium, long-term basis on, on the basis of that we really did believe a transition period was going to come into effect and we'd have till 1st of January 2021. So that was our short to medium-term plan, which I'll, I'll briefly run through with you. And then, of course, as we got closer to March and April and the potential reality of a cliff-edge Brexit, a lot of the planning went out the window and now it was simply, well, what do I need to make sure I can import and export? So I'm also going to go through that towards the end. And at the workshop... 
later on for anyone who signed up to the workshop, we're going to go through the very specific minimum requirements that need to be in place to ensure you do continue to trade. Um, so for anybody who, and I think this is also uh, what I've noticed in working with clients over the last two years, is that certainly for purchases and sales in the EU, the supply chain actually is very unknown. Your goods arrive, your goods um, get delivered, but you haven't had, a lot of companies don't have a lot of visibility into how they arrive or how they get delivered. And that's fair enough. We've been operating in a single market environment, and that's the pure benefit of the single market. So once you have goods entering Europe or being manufactured in Ireland, they're free to move throughout Europe with no further customs controls. They get to the customer, there's no obligation on you to pay customs duties, there's no controls at the customs, at the ports. There are controls on excisable goods, but that's all. Um, on everything else, they move freely. So I found that companies don't really realize often how their hauliers or their freight forwarders get their goods to their customers or how their goods arrive at their premises. Contracts are sometimes formalized, sometimes not. Um, there's often a delivered duty paid, has come up a couple of times this morning, that the goods are delivered duty paid um, as a rule. But in fact, in a single market concept, that just means delivered, because there is no duty in the single market. So when you have to actually look at that and re-look at your contracts and rewrite them, it's really important to ensure that you aren't getting caught in a situation um, through uh, just not being aware of it, that you're caught in a delivered duty pay contract. So in the EU, we've got an assumption of free circulation status, we've got goods cleared moving freely, and then um, we've, we simply look at Europe in customs terms as one country. So customs duties themselves are remitted to Brussels, they're not an Irish tax, they're a European tax, and the regulation itself is set by Brussels. So we have no input, it's directly implementable in all member states, everybody operates it exactly the same way, there's no derogation, and as a result, we operate effectively when we're talking about a customs world as one country. Going forward, so that's our, our simplified movement of goods, really no controls, no checks. Going forward, however, um, once the UK comes out of the um, EU, we're now in a situation that we're crossing either a non-EU um, border to get back into Europe, which is the issues we have with the, the land bridge, um, or we're exporting to or purchasing from a non-EU country. So now you're leaving Dublin, you've got to control your goods at export from, and I'm just using Dublin as, as one of the ports, um, you've got to lodge your export declarations on leaving Dublin, and you've got to lodge them at least two hours in advance. You've got to go through customs controls. You then have to arrive in the UK, you have to lodge your customs declarations at least two hours in advance. You have to pay your customs duties, lodge your import declarations. If you're going down the transit, <coughs> You then have to have be part of the national transit system. You need to make sure your guarantees are in place to cover the duty that's being suspended or that your hauliers have those guarantees in place. And it does slightly concern me that the hauliers wouldn't, aren't, and, and sometimes are not, um, that not a lot of hauliers are prepared for the transit system. So you have to have that haulier, that um, haulier has to have the documentation in the cab. That needs to be checked by UK customs. So the haulier needs to know and the, and the driver needs to know what happens when they literally get on the boat, get off the boat. Then you've got to go across to Calais and start the whole process all over again. So the, the difficulty here is, before we even get to customs duties, this process is going to take time. And the really critical point, particularly for perishables, is that as much as possible is done to prepare to ensure that you minimize the time and the delays that are involved. And the way to do that is to ensure documentation is in place, that hauliers are definitely at this stage without question telling you what their processes and procedures are, that they have actually trained their drivers, because not all drivers speak English, so what's going to happen when you roll off the boat and you don't know which way to go and you're interacting with a customs officer. And you've got all the backup detail necessary and you know basically what sits in the cab and how you get, um, get through the authorities. These are fairly straightforward basic issues, but they are going to be what's going to cause the delays. And that's before we get to the kind of more complicated how do we determine tariff classification? How do we go through origin? How do we fill out a declaration? So in looking at a six month plan, um, I would say that uh, these are the minimum issues. And I'm, I'm, I think it's, it's great when we look at the um, Brexit barometer that um, the results have shown that actually everybody who's gone through customs controls and gone through the work with Board BIA and has um, put the process in place has scored very high. I feel like giving out gold stars to everybody at the stage. 
So we've got, in particular, our, our tariff costs, and um, as uh, determining the tariff classification is probably one of the most complicated aspects of customs um, rules. It not only is essential, it has, has to be correct for the purposes of compliance. It's important for security, for um, ensuring whether goods can get in or out of the country, and then it determines the actual duty you're going to pay. So before you start anything, you must concentrate on tariff classification. And it's something that uh, my colleague David is here, who specializes in classification. It's something that we always start our workshops on. What's the classification? How do you get to the classification? How do you put together a part master file so that you're giving that information to your agents? And 85% of the respondents now are very comfortable with classification. So I think that is a great result for Borbia, um, and delighted to see it. On the supply chain side, um, we've, you need to, as, we've, as a lot of people have said, you need to map your purchases and sales. Again, if you don't know what you're buying in from um, a country or selling into a country, how are you going to know what the duty rate and the compliance costs are going to be? So our bi a big issue, and really it's a, essential, and anybody who hasn't done this to date, you really do need to um, establish where are your goods coming from and where are they going to. And if you notice I'm saying, where are they coming from and going to, not who, you, who you're buying or selling off necessarily. So we've had situations where you might be buying from a UK distributor, but the goods are coming directly from France. Well, they're, if they go round Europe, say, as going through the, through the land bridge, they're never going to leave Europe, so we're not really that concerned about it. But if you're buying from a French customer and the goods are actually being delivered from a UK manufacturer, now they're getting caught in the customs net. So you need to know who you're buying from, who you're selling to, but more particularly, where are those goods coming from and where are those goods going to? And what I always say is just literally draw up a map. If your goods cross a border, if they leave the EU at any point or enter the EU at any point, then you have a customs obligation and then you need to actually start working through that. Um, you need to review your contracts. And again, a lot of people have done that already. We've got very good statistics um, on that. So um, I think 89% really have gone through this process here on the left, which is excellent. And there's always been a bit of concern, well, should I raise this with my customer or my supplier or should I not? And certainly on the DDP terms, which would be very typical for Irish exporters to, um, to the UK, when you contract to deliver duty paid, you do contract to take care of all the customs responsibilities. So when tying yourself into a contract going forward or over the next 12 months, it is really critical to have that discussion with your customer because it's not simply a matter of you're continuing to take responsibility and maybe now there's no duty rates, so don't worry about it. You remember, you've got to also take care of the compliance costs, the lodging, the declarations, the making sure the goods aren't caught at the port. So there's a lot of obligations that really need to be resolved. And it, it's not straightforward to simply say that um, an Irish company can take those on board without it having any impact on the pricing. On the compliance course, we find that when you actually start de delving into then the supply chain and looking at um, the compliance costs, and now we're talking about every, you know, lodging a declaration for every time something moves into the EU or out of the EU, the compliance costs can often be as expensive as any duty costs. So if you're looking at lodging a customs declaration, and let's say you are taking responsibility for both sides, for every import there's an export and vice versa. A very average rule of thumb would be you're paying an agent 50 euros for every SAD or, or declaration that ma that's made. That's 100 euros for every movement of goods. Now, if you've got four or five shipments a day, five days a week, over 52 weeks a year, suddenly those costs are starting to mount up and become very unsustainable. So you really do need to know um, what your agent is going to charge you for making a declaration work out, does that make sense? And in some cases, it absolutely will. Or do you need to bring that um, in-house? But in that case, do you need to start looking for staff? Do you need to train the staff? Do you need to buy a software system? That all is going to take at least three or four months. So that absolutely needs to be started immediately. It's a very serious concern at the moment, and Revenue are working on this aspect um, of the customs um, capability because we simply don't have enough customs agents in the country. We're down about 3,000 in order to actually make the declarations that are going to be required. If we look at imports alone, import declarations are going to rise from about 873,000 a year to 2.5 million a year post-Brexit. Similarly, on the export side, we've got about 800,000 rising to about 1.5 million. 
But that's a massive increase in the number of declarations that need to be lodged. And that's a massive increase in the number of people who need to be available to lodge those declarations. So it's, again, in going back to your hauliers, which would probably be your first port of call, or your freight forwarders, they need to be giving clear confirmation of whether they can or cannot do those declarations. Because if they can't, then you need to look for an independent broker, of which there aren't a huge amount. Or thirdly, you need to look at how do I do this in-house? But you need to know that at this stage, because leaving it to the last minute will simply mean that you simply cannot import or export. So regardless of anything else, if those declarations can't go in the system, the import can't happen, the export can't happen. Following on that, we look at the risk of border delays, particularly important for perishable products, obviously. Um, and in that context, I do want to kind of call out the um, traces and the registration with DAFM. And I know uh, you're going to be talking about it later on. But there is a, a desk here for registration. There's 50% of companies have registered, but that means there's 50% haven't. So if you haven't registered, you really must register before 31st of October and understand what the um, regulatory requirements are for importing and exporting through traces, getting health certs, and um, we'll have a lot more detail on that later, but uh, just absolutely, please do not leave without registering if you haven't registered, because that is an absolute essential. So that brings us into, uh, there are other areas, obviously I'm only focusing on food and drink here, but we do um, have other industries such as pharma and chemicals also have issues, and then there's labeling issues, which, which I'm not gonna go through. And then finally, you're looking at planning ahead. Um, in terms of implementing training in-house. And again, as I said, anybody who hasn't taken advantage of the Borbia training programs really should because it's, you can see the um, increase in numbers from where people were last year to where people are this year. Looking at AEO and seeing whether AEO is going to be appropriate for your business. Um, AEO will simplify the movement of goods through customs, but it won't unfortunately simplify your agricultural requirements. And then you want to look at transitional simplified procedures and other procedures available in the UK, which will enable you to um, avoid lodging customs declarations. So, you know, you, they're, they're not that complicated to apply for, but unfortunately the restrictions are quite high. So if you want to lodge, if you want to um, obtain a simplified transitional procedure in the UK, um, you do need to be established in the UK. So if you're an Irish exporter with no UK establishment, you're not going to be able to apply for that, and therefore you may need to look at your VAT and tax planning. Again, which is going to take a couple of months. So that overall is the, um, the overall program. And if we just go through that in a little bit more detail, um, and I'm looking at the, the Brexit barometer, um, the top six current customs issues that seem to come through mostly from the, re from the report were the import duty costs, <coughs> customs compliance and clearance, cash flow, um, the UK specific import costs, the SPS checks and the contracts, which said we've kind of really always touch on um, as part of that whole program. So if we look first at the import duty costs, um, sorry, okay, so if we look at duties, uh, in the industrial area, du duties don't tend to be that high. They can be up to 14%, um, but they tend to ravage around 5%. So they're not gonna be make or break. Unfortunately, um, in the agricultural area, we're looking at up to 50%. And as one of our speakers said earlier, a WTO average of 27%. For the UK, they, as I said, have introduced a temporary tariff for the next 12 months. 82% um, of products are going to be duty-free, but that does not include um, certain beef, dairy, pork, or lamb. So um, one and very important thing, obviously, to start doing is once you know your tariff classifications, to check what the duty rate is going to be. The EU very kindly have produced that tariff on the market access database, uh, which is a database that if anybody who is currently exporting outside the EU um, uses, it gives you the duty rates available in all non-EU countries. So it's been uploaded there, so it's easily accessible. And very important therefore to just check, are your goods going to be 0%, are they going to be um, dutiable, and what that duty rate is going to be. On the EU side, if you're importing into Europe, obviously it's said the rates aren't going to change. Um, for the EU rates, if you look up TARIC, um, again, we'll go through this at the workshops, again, you'll get the EU rate. So we have our two rates, they are available and they are um, easily accessible. And along with that, then you'll have your excise duties payable at the border. 
uh, your import VAT, if, but if, if you're VAT registered, VAT, various reliefs have been introduced so you don't have to pay VAT on import into Europe or into Ireland or on import into the UK and you can account for them in your VAT return. And then, uh, I'm not going to go through all the trade wars and Trump and all the rest of us to be here for another, uh, another couple of hours, but there are other um, charges that can apply too. I'm not expecting anybody to read this, so don't worry about it. Um, but this is a list of the tariffs that was, um, concluded, uh, that was put together by um, Ed Edgar Montegro and Martina Lawless, just showing the range of tariffs going from the industrial at the top down to our food and drink at the bottom. So as we can see, once you start getting into cocoa, vegetables, processed cereals, and on down to meat, our rates start increasing. Um, at a huge rate. And this table just gives then an average of the uh, simple um, tariff rates that are available and the number of line items. So in looking at tariff classification, the reason I put this one up here is because when we look at our number of line items, there are 351 potential classifications for animal products, or for animals. So the tariff is unfortunately not particularly um, easy to follow. I think it was written in the 1950s, so it doesn't reflect a lot of the products that are here today. They never heard of an iPhone, for example. So you really have to kind of work through what are the classification. And if it's not an obvious heading, what's the closest? What's the most likely heading for your product? If you've got two or three, that's not going to take that long. But if you've got like 6,000 or 7,000, then you're working through quite a number of um, classifications. And following that then, once you've confirmed your tariff classifications, assessed your rates, um, you then need to assess your nursing additions. And for anybody who's had the joy of dealing with agricultural charges, it's about you have to go through your sugar content, your milk protein content, your um, what is it called? milk protein, milk sugar, fat, syrup, yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a whole bundle of them. So you need to have the, the, you need to know the percentage for each imported product in order to be able to determine what that additional charge is going to be. On the upside, which there isn't, isn't too many of, um, there is tariff quotas in place. So there may be availability for, um, based on that line item for a tariff quota, so for a lower duty rate. And then finally, if you're absolutely uncertain, of what the duty is going to be or the tariff classification is going to be, the revenue do provide confirmation by way of a classification ruling called the BTI. Um, on average, that's taking about three months to go through the system at the moment, so um, you need to factor that time frame in, but it's very useful because it means that you do have confirmation of the tariff code and that's the end of it. Nobody will question it any further. So in a post-audit situation or at the border, once that tariff of BTI is quoted on your SAD document, which is your declaration, there's no longer any requirement for um, a check to be done. So I'm going to keep an eye on the time. So the next thing then to go through is your customs compliance, as I said, and your clearance cost. I've put both of these together. Um, compliance and clearance do tend to go together. Very, uh, most of our, uh, our, our borders are quite open insofar as when you're exporting a product, um, only about 2% will get checked at the border. For imports, it's up to 5%. So we don't have a heavily um, checked border, so to speak. Unfortunately, for a number of agricultural products, you're up to 100% of goods that do need to sometimes go through the agricultural checks. So building in your customs compliance and having that correct is very important. One of the things that can simply cause delays, and which is totally avoidable, is just a lack of incorrect information on the declaration and a lack of correct documents to support it. Once you've gone through customs clearance, then you're really into a post-audit situation. So everybody who imports and exports will be audited by revenue within three years, and that's really where we, where we focus most of our audit checks. So you, again, need to just make sure in um, importing and exporting that you do keep the documents very easily available in one pack. So find that if you go back three years to look for an import entry, sometimes it can be impossible. On the clearance side, then what um, it's great uh, on the... Oh. Okay, so really great statistics on the ERI registration. 85% um, of... Uh, Gorbia clients are all registered, which is probably three times the national average. So that's fantastic. Um, very good news. So I don't need to worry about that anymore. Um, 
On the upskilling side, again, we've, I think we've 170 companies have gone through the uh, customs training program. So um, upskilling, I think it, it, people are very familiar with customs compliance and the customs processes. And again, we see that in the, um, in the report back. We've talked about assessing the clearance costs, identifying clearance agents, and that would really be my main concern at the moment, to identify the clearance, co the clearance agents. And uh, that's come out through the barometer as well that only about, uh, I think about 40% have an actual agent in place. So again, as a takeaway, one of the important takeaways from this morning, I'd say just make sure that you have a customs clearance agent absolutely in place. If not, look at your IT systems and see whether you need to bring those um, clearance options in-house. And finally, prepare a customs procedure. So I think we've moved really from the first three um, say last year, down to the next three um, at this point where I'd say the main focus should be. On the cash flow side, um, I'm assuming that probably everybody is VAT registered in Ireland. So um, the revenue and the government have introduced simplification whereby companies who are VAT registered can account for that import VAT on their VAT returns. So that's obviously a huge benefit. If, again, you're VAT registered in the UK, um, the same can apply. Contracts, uh, again, we talked about that. Um, ideally, XWorks is your best situation where your customer comes and picks up from your plant and delivered duty paid being the worst, unfortunately. The transitional simplified procedures, as I mentioned, allow you to defer giving a full declaration um, but they do require a deferred payment account and you need to register. To register, you must have an EORI number and be established in the UK. And I'll leave the SPS checks to yourself. Uh, and then finally, um, we get to... It's tomorrow, it's happening next week. Um, what do we do then? And we have a number of handouts for everybody who, um, and we leave a couple here then as well for anybody who doesn't attend the customs workshops. But in a nutshell, if you want to um, just boil all that down to what must I do for next week? Let's say we were heading back to March and April, and I certainly don't ever want to go through the last two weeks or that first two weeks in April again um, in terms of everything that needs to be done. But what we did learn was what were the absolute essentials, what you must have in place. Um, first one being the URI, which is fantastic um, that everybody has that. Next was a deferred payment account, and really that's going to be something that we're going to focus on in the workshops, how to put that deferred payment account in place. Thirdly was classification, which I think everybody's pretty good on. Um, fourth was the getting the agents and getting the declarations in place. And uh, fifth was, and I can't read it here, but we do, as I said, have the handouts. Um, I can't even read the slide here, but it was uh, reviewing your contracts. Looking sixth, we had ensuring that your agricultural checks were in place, um, checking on your position on exporting to the UK, and then looking at the position in relation to Northern Ireland. So these were our essential checks, and then rolling back up to where we started for the longer term picture. So there is a handout for everybody, so you don't need to worry too much about reading it um, up here. So that's a very rapid talk through. Um, how to prepare for Brexit, both from here today, looking forward to 31st of October, and also from um, two to three weeks beforehand, once we get into that last stretch. If anyone has any, any questions? Uh, yes. If I may, just a comment. Okay. Um, I, I picked up on threads about DDP versus other means. Realistically, from a food industry yeah. perspective, I don't see anything other than DDP working in the main if your products are going direct to your customers. And I fully accept it works in other scenarios. Yeah. I just do, do not accept, and I can't see it happening, how anything other than DDP will be demanded by customers in the UK yeah. who are still customers post-Brexit. Yeah. And that obviously puts a... Um, if you will, uh, an onus on companies to manage the communication and, and calculations around cost, duties, and so forth, um, and all that needs to be spoken to the customer about. Yeah. And that's just a comment. I, I, no, I, just, I just don't see it happening. It's absolutely correct. I mean, I certainly have found that um, that's, good, that's the standard. You know, we, we'd ideally like to move to other options, but there is no other options. 
So then on the basis that you've got DDP, you're faced with the worst case scenario, then the question is, how do you handle that with your customer? Because if your customer is still saying, well, we're not increasing the prices, but your prices are going substantially up, that's not logical either. Yeah, that's not customs, but it's to be aware that when you, when you sign that DDP contract, you are taking those extra costs on. Uh, hi, just when you import raw material from, we'll say the UK, which at that stage might be outside the EU, okay, you take it in, you put it into a finished product and you re-export it out to the US can you, uh, to the UK or yeah. elsewhere, can you draw back or go down the road of inward processing yeah. to yeah. claim back the duty? Absolutely. Um, so if you import materials for manufacture and re-export, you need to then apply mm -hmm. to the Revenue Commissioners for, as you say, an inward processing um, authorisation, which means you suspend all customs duties on import into Ireland. And then once those goods are re-exported, those duties are written off. Uh, you need to put in place an economic argument, so you need to say why that is not going to have any impact negatively on a European producer, why you need to get those goods from the UK, and you need to show revenue that you can track those goods through the system, so that you can track from your import from the UK, through your manufacturing, through your re-export. So you can have those three aspects to look at. First, the application. Um, secondly, then the economic argument, or really first the economic argument, then the application. And thirdly, really critically, the management of the system. So if you're looking at that, again, it's taking about three months to get through revenue at the least at the moment. So you, you want to be looking at kind of building towards making that application fairly quickly. Thanks. Uh, we have a scenario where we are supplied, or we buy a product directly from the EU but their sister company in the UK invoice us. Yep. We order through them and they invoice us and we pay the company in the UK. Post-Brexit, will we have to deal directly with? No, um, again, if it's how, how are those goods arriving in Ireland? Are yeah, they they're, they're not coming through the UK, they're coming directly from Round, yep. yeah. Never, once the goods never leave the EU, then they arrive, they leave. You know, well, your only cons customs concern is where products depart the EU and re-enter the EU. So there's an assumption of free circulation status um, to start with as EU status. So if your goods are coming from France on a boat over from France, but you're actually, you know, the invoice is from the UK, customs are not interested. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Carl. Shane from Bordia. Um, You're not supposed to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, it's, it's great that food and drink companies in Ireland, by and large, seem to have now their EORI number from revenue. So that's brilliant. You mentioned that some companies will need one from the UK side as well. Yeah. So what are the, are the circumstances in which a company will need the UK one? And in order to get it, they need to be established in the UK. So what does that mean exactly as well? Okay. So the, the UK are going backwards and forwards on this. Um, the EORI is a European registration. So once the UK leave, then your European registration doesn't apply in the UK. So you'll need to apply from the UK authorities. Now, initially they were saying that you needed to apply prior to um, Brexit. Now they're saying that they will accept European EORIs for a temporary period of time. At some point though, you're gonna need your own customs registration in the UK and for that, um, they haven't been completely clear. It's usually it's going to have to be a place of business. So even so, for example, if you look at a European registration, you don't need to have a, a, an establishment in Europe to get an EORI. You need to just be importing or exporting because it's a database. And the same will likely happen in the UK. So you'll have your customs registration once you import or export. But what you won't be able to get if you're not established is a deferred payment account. So that could be more critical. So you're kind of bouncing between EORI registration deferred payment account and transitional simplified procedures and then import VAT um, simplifications. So in looking at all four together, you really have to start saying, okay, well, do I need an establishment? Do I need to be VAT registered? But I think there was certainly up to April, for the April deadline, they were giving a temporary period of, I think about six months to continue to use the European ERI. And I think that's possibly going to probably continue, but those kind of notices are going to come out, keep coming out every, every week, so to speak.
Okay, I think a round of applause for Carol. That was uh, very informative.